People love to eat salmon, but chances are that salmon is not wild and was raised on a fish farm. 70% of the salmon we now eat is raised using aquaculture. There isn't enough wild salmon to meet global demand. So what's the big deal? Well, wild salmon stocks are declining all along Canada's west coast. Many scientists believe that the use of open net fish farms could be contributing to the decline. Ironically, the salmon farms that are supposed to take pressure off wild salmon stocks may be destroying them. Hey everyone, I'm Tyler. And this is my younger brother, Alex. And together, we're the Water Brothers. We're gonna take you on an adventure around the world to explore the state of our blue planet, a planet defined by water and its ability to sustain life. So join us on our journey as we explore the world, looking at the most important water stories of our time. And together, we will learn how to better protect our most precious resource. Lots of people consider salmon to be a food that you can get easily, but actually the costs of producing this salmon are immense. Well, the fact that we're doing aquaculture is protecting wild salmon, and the way we do it today offers many, many benefits, uh, very minimal risks. There is no mechanism within the government to actually protect wild salmon from the salmon farming corporate laws. Salmon farming has always been controversial, and much to our surprise, the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans that is responsible for protecting wild salmon is also in charge of protecting and promoting the salmon farming industry. The industry is dominated by foreign companies, and to top it off, almost all the fish farmed on the West Coast is exported to the US, so the product and profits go elsewhere. We wanted to find out if all this is happening at the cost of our wild salmon and Pacific coastal ecosystem. So we set out for British Columbia, the heart of Canada's salmon farming industry and home to the greatest wild salmon habitat on Earth. It's actually really hard to overstate how people feel about uh, salmon on this coast. Salmon is an icon, aquatic species of, of British Columbia. Wild salmon are, are British Columbia. They're a part of our identity. Without the wild fish, we're not gonna live. British Columbia is home to such a large salmon aquaculture industry for the same reason it's home to wild salmon. An abundance of cold, clean water to raise salmon during all the stages of their complex life cycle. After being born in a river, wild salmon will spend about a year migrating towards the ocean. Once in the ocean, they will spend about two to four years there before returning to the exact same river they were born, where they will spawn and begin the life cycle once again. So Tyler and I are here on the banks of the Kluxu River in northern Vancouver Island, and we're here filming salmon. But we just stopped right here to take a look at this dead pink salmon because it really helps tell the story of why these fish are so important to the region. We've seen bears and eagles all along the river here. And when these fish swim up river to spawn, they'll feed all these animals, they'll feed the people here, and they help transport nutrients from the ocean into the forest and into this ecosystem. And it's these group of fish that make this region and this ecosystem so unique and important. The five species on the west coast here all die after spawning. And so there's a bag of nutrients sitting there. So I sort of think of salmon as like conveyor belts of nutrients. And they get there by um, the migrating salmon that come up, are dragged ashore by wolves, bears, you name it. When we go into the, the river systems and we look at the chemical analysis of the trees in these forests along these rivers, 30% of the nutrients that these trees depend on are actually derived from salmon carcasses. So if wild salmon seem to be everywhere, why is it necessary to grow them in farms? The question of why grow fish in farms originated back in the day when people were worried about wild stocks and they wanted to take pressure off wild fish. We'll grow them in a farm and let the wild fish survive and they can then be there for, uh, well, for humans and also wildlife. And so there were good intentions to start with. But after that, it seems that um, the evidence that there can be harmful effects of these fish farms has not really filtered through enough uh, so that people are willing to actually necessarily make the difficult decisions they need to about how to manage the problem. While the specific concerns about the salmon farming industry have evolved, two major problems remain. 
the use of wild fish needed to feed carnivorous salmon, and the practice of raising foreign Atlantic salmon in open net pens that allow wildlife, fish waste, and fish diseases and parasites to flow freely in and out of the cages. When the salmon aquaculture industry began in BC in the 1970s, local farmers tried raising native Pacific salmon, but could not compete against cheaper farm salmon from Europe. In the early 1980s, a group of companies from Norway moved in to farm their own Norwegian species of Atlantic salmon in BC. When what I call the Norwegian invasion occurred into British Columbia, and we had these companies coming in, pushing the, uh, the smaller Pacific salmon producers aside, they said, well, we've invested millions of dollars into uh, raising Atlantic salmon, marketing Atlantic salmon around the world. We're not about to undermine that success by doing Pacific salmon. I was, at the time, working for the provincial government, and I can say with, with confidence that the amount of environmental assessment that went into the decision of whether or not it would be a good idea to bring Atlantic salmon into farm in British Columbia was zero. And so we had literally overnight this proliferation of Atlantic salmon. Today, British Columbia produces about 75,000 tons of farmed Atlantic salmon, or about 12 million fish every single year. Over 90% of the farms in BC are owned and operated by just three Norwegian corporations that export almost all of their farm salmon to the US. And while the majority of profits and products leave Canada, all of the environmental damage stays here. To understand the impacts of salmon farming, we would need to see how a salmon farm actually operates. And our first stop would be a freshwater nursery. All right, we're here with Ian Roberts of Marine Harvest Canada, and uh, you've been working in salmon aquaculture for over 20 years. Um, explain a little bit about this facility we're in right now and how many fish are in this building here. Well, this is an important part of uh, our fish's life cycle. So farm-raised salmon have a life cycle of about three years and a year of that will be spent in these type of facilities, land-based recirculating aquaculture systems. Right now in this room, we're sitting here with 460,000 fish within these four tanks, and they will stay here, like I said, for about one year to grow to about 100 gram size. And following the natural life cycle of the salmon, just like when they move from freshwater rivers into the ocean, we will move them from our freshwater nursery sites to the ocean-based pens where they'll spend the next two years until they're ready for harvest at about uh, a six kilo size. The RAS, or recirculating aquaculture system we visited, uses state-of-the-art technology to raise Atlantic salmon in total isolation from the outside environment. The water and oxygen in the tanks is constantly being recycled and recirculated. And even the solid waste produced by the fish can be used as fertilizer. Why can't you do this type of system throughout the life cycle of the fish? Is that possible and why isn't it being done already? We really don't care whether we raise fish on land or in the ocean, as long as two key things are met. That's the needs of the business. It's a viable, sustainable business. And yes, that does mean that you can make a profit at the end of the day. And also the needs of the fish. You have a healthy, top quality product and a really good farm-raised salmon coming out the other end. And we've noticed that the mix of these two technologies that we're using today, about one-third land-based freshwater systems, two-thirds seawater-based, seem to provide what's needed for the business and what's needed for the fish. Our next stop would take us to the saltwater open net pens, the most important and controversial element of every salmon farm, where the fish will spend the majority of their lives. As we learn from the BC Salmon Farmers Association, a typical farm will include a group of 10 to 14 square pens that are each home to about 50,000 fish. Modern farms are also highly automated, especially for the feeding process, since an average farm will go through about seven tons of feed pellets every single day. But to really get a sense of what a fish farm is like, the most awesome view is always from inside the cages. All right, so today we started our journey with the BC Salmon Farmers Association, and we're gonna get to dive in our first open net pen and see what it really looks like from the inside. Let's go. Ready to do this? Yeah. All right. Diving in the salmon pen was such a unique experience. While we were amazed to learn how so many fish could be raised in such a small area, we were also surprised to see how much fish waste was floating all around us. Even wild fish were swimming inside the cages and being eaten by the farm salmon. 
with only a few mesh nets separating them from the wild. It didn't seem like the most secure option to keep the foreign Atlantic salmon from escaping. Open net pen cages are, just as they sound, they're, they're nets in the open ocean, storms, human air, marine mammals, all sorts of things can cause escapes. And when they do, you've now you're dealing with what is an exotic species, escaping into what is one of the last and probably the greatest salmon habitat in the world. The concern is that these invasive species could displace native Pacific salmon by competing with them for local food sources. One common way that Atlantic salmon escape into the wild is when seals and sea lions rip open the nets trying to get access to an easy meal. To deal with the problem, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans provides licenses to salmon farmers to kill marine mammals. And between 1990 and 2010, over 7,000 seals and sea lions have been shot and killed due to interactions with BC salmon farms. One of the biggest headaches uh, the farmers out here deal with are, are seals and sea lions that are shot indiscriminately because they're considered farmers and, and these are, are pests that endanger the herd. After seeing the sheer amount of fecal matter floating around in the pens, we also wanted to figure out what this waste could be doing to the surrounding environment and the ocean floor where it settles. Is there any other sort of livestock industries that can just let their effluent go like that? No other farmer never shovels their manure. No other industry is allowed to let everything pour into the ocean. It's just a wasteland down there, very soft, greenish muck. It smothers the seafloor but some see it differently. What we find is that underneath our environment, the impact is, is well, there is no impact in the sense that we cannot keep farming in our areas until we prove that the impact on the environment is back to background levels. The, the big difference with salmon farms is you got the currents moving through them. The fish farmers are using those currents as a free flush. They never have to shovel their manure but uh, the result is the pathogens are spreading. Today, we would never allow wild birds into a chicken farm because of the H1N1 virus. You don't want those wild birds picking the virus up and taking it all over. But that's what's happening in salmon farms. The viruses mutate and uh, uh, explode in population. They're all built to disperse like that. And you've got these currents washing it out of the farm into the wild environment. So this free flow of pathogens we don't allow that in terrestrial farms, but that's what's going on out there in the water. The free flow of fish waste out of the pens also means that farm salmon are vulnerable to fish diseases flowing into the cages from the wild. So what happens when a wild salmon disease enters a fish farm? There's approximately 600,000 to a million Atlantic salmon per farm, and this breaks all the natural laws of salmon. Salmon are built to move, number one, Number two, there's a predator for every single life stage of salmon, starting with the egg up to the big taiz. And when a wild salmon becomes sick, the predators take them out. Anybody that swims slow or starts to wobble or is the back of the school, boom, gone. The pathogen's taken away. But in the farm situation, these large groups of fish are crowded together, so the pathogens have a great time just jumping fish to fish. There's no predators allowed inside, and so the fish remain contagious for a much longer period of time. The only virus that's been any issue for our industry in the last decade has been the IHN virus. Although salmon viruses pose no threat to humans, they do make salmon very sick. Biologists state that they can impact reproduction rates and even be fatal. Despite continued efforts by the industry to control IHN, the virus continues to cause problems, even as late as 2012, when two BC farms were forced to kill over 880,000 of their own fish during two separate outbreaks to prevent the disease from spreading any further. We're dealing with situations where not just one farm is at risk. Now we've got multiple farms. And when you look at where they're actually located, they're right in the middle of very narrow inside passage channels where the entire stock of salmon from the Fraser and the myriad rivers are all moving up and forced through these little bottlenecks. And therefore, the potential impact of these farms is far greater than would otherwise be, be the case. The biggest concern today is whether the farmed Atlantic salmon that are imported from Norway could be introducing a foreign salmon disease known as ISA, 
or infectious salmon anemia, against which Pacific salmon have no natural immunity. There's been no history of any exotic viruses. You know, there's in the media, you hear about ISA, all these different exotic viruses to Canada. There's been no history of that, and that's despite serially sampling our stocks. However, it should be noted that Norwegian aquaculture companies have already been implicated in spreading ISA to other major salmon farming regions with catastrophic results in Chile that caused a loss of 15,000 jobs and over $2 billion in damages. ISA virus is definitely here. It's an influenza, it's a fish influenza, and um, 80 to 90% of Atlantics have it back there in Norway. And we've gotten 30 million Atlantic eggs brought into here. On the egg import forms, nobody had to put a signature down saying there's no ISA. Somehow that was missing. That's what triggered me to go looking for it. We've been sampling and sending it off to labs in Prince Edward Island, labs in Norway, and yeah, they're finding it. They're finding virulent, strains that have been a big problem in Chile and have been a big problem in Norway. And government's just like, nope, we don't believe your tests. Must be contamination. Where would I get contamination from ISA, you know? You can't buy it in a bottle and sprinkle it over the fish. The presence of foreign viruses and disease in BC is still being investigated. But what is clear is that when you raise salmon in open net pens, there is nothing to prevent diseases from transferring between wild and farmed fish. And the best option available to solve this problem is to take the open net pens out of the ocean. Ultimately, the solution is to separate wild fish from farm fish, which means using uh, a method of closing off the, the farms. So if you move the farms onto land, for example, you can use a recirculating system and basically get control of the wastewater, which is what is transporting the disease out to the wild. I think closed containment is, is it's going to be the ultimate solution to this problem. As we already saw, closed containment technology exists, and it is the salmon farmers that have developed it to raise salmon during their freshwater life cycle. So why aren't they using this technology for the adult salmon as well? The reason that people have been reluctant to do, make this switch is simply cost. It's the price. Uh, I, the industry is understandably reluctant to simply close up shop, move all their pens into big, new facilities on land, it's expensive, because right now the environment is paying the costs of getting rid of the fish's waste, of bringing oxygen to them, keeping, keeping them cool enough, and, and in absorbing these diseases. Well, if the environment isn't gonna pay that cost anymore, then consumers are gonna to have to pay that cost, the industry is gonna to have to pay that cost, and they're not going to do that, I believe, unless they can see either they're forced to or they can see a good economic incentive to do it. One First Nations group on Vancouver Island has decided to make the investment and raise salmon in closed systems for the entire fish life cycle to prevent the transfer of salmon diseases into the wild. So today we're here with Chief Bill Cranmer of the Nambus First Nation and we're here to check out this new facility that's under construction that's going to be harvesting Atlantic salmon. So how are you doing today, Bill? Very good, very good. Tell us a little bit about this project and uh, what inspired you to get it started. Well, what inspired us to get started, of course, is our concern for the, uh, the effects of the open net fish farms on wild salmon. We wanted to uh, prove that you could grow Atlantic salmon in closed containment systems on land. One of the concerns that uh, I've heard about closed containment systems is that they're a little bit more energy intensive than open net pens. I think in the end, it'll be less. Unlike net pen farms that need to run diesel generators 24 seven and use boats to transport goods between the farms and the mainland, the Namgis project has the potential to become the more energy efficient option since they are already located on the mainland and connected to the local power supply. If this project succeeds, it could prove once and for all that close containment is not only competitive, but would also make it possible to grow salmon directly in cities like Toronto, Los Angeles, or Montreal. And even though these fish will cost a little more, the belief is that as people become more aware of the benefits, they will choose the more sustainable option. The future of this technology is very promising, but one major obstacle to its sustainability will still remain and that is the need to use wild fish in the diet of farm salmon. On a global food budget basis, farm salmon costs food. It's just that it, you can make a lot more money selling a relatively small amount of farm salmon than selling the relatively large amount 
of edible fish that went into making it, mackerel, sardines, etc. The more salmon you produce, the less fish you have because you need fish meal to produce salmon and you, you, you produce this fish meal out of fish that are edible. So salmon is not a, the production of fish, it's a transformation of fish. Salmon feed is made in part from fish meal and fish oil, concentrated products requiring large volumes of small ocean fish to produce. We wanted to know if the production of salmon feed could be contributing to the depletion of wild fisheries. So we went to sit down with fish feed manufacturer Jason Mann to learn how much pressure the industry actually puts on wild fish stocks. One of the widely quoted statistics um, that I've come across many times is that it takes three kilograms, or give or take, of wild caught fish to produce one kilogram of salmon, farm salmon. Yeah, that, that number is overstating uh, the actual situation. In the earlier days, the conversions were of uh, those type of nature where the diets were fish meal and fish oil based. But today, we're getting levels of about 1 to 1.1 in terms of conversion efficiency on today's diets. So in other words, we're equal in terms of fish meal that we put in, and then we're getting a yield out of protein of fish source in the salmon. So where does the rest of the protein come from? What we learned is that feed companies have been able to replace wild fish protein with other products such as chicken meat, bones and feathers, and vegetables such as soybeans and corn. Despite these improvements, the pressure on wild fish stocks remains, as it still requires a greater amount of wild fish to produce a lesser amount of farm salmon. So what is the solution? Should we all just switch to only eating wild salmon? The truth? is that there isn't enough wild salmon left on this planet to meet global demand. And if aquaculture is going to help satisfy this demand, it should not be at the risk of endangering one of the last remaining wild salmon habitats on Earth. The most helpful thing, I think, would be for consumers to understand you know, what they're eating and to make decisions about what kind of seafood they want. If people want to eat sustainably produced seafood, which includes minimal impacts on the environment, there are lots of programs to help them figure that out. One group, known as the OceanWise program, creates handy pocket guides and smartphone applications that connect consumers with seafood from sustainably managed fisheries. And their symbol can be found beside sustainable seafood options at restaurants and grocery stores across Canada. One of the important things to remember is that consumers have a huge amount of power to change how things are being conducted, especially with fisheries and, and seafood, because really what what the producers are, are catching or producing is dictated by what we are going to buy and what we're going to eat. If we don't buy it, they're not going to go out and catch it or they're not going to farm it. So consumers have a lot of power to change the way that fisheries or farms are being conducted worldwide. And knowing that this is the most immediate threat facing our oceans, it's time now that we really need to pay attention and make responsible choices with our seafood. People need to realize that is the powerful system that makes food. And nobody is telling the aquaculture industry that they have to go away. All we're saying is get away from our fish. All of the issues, escapes, diseases, parasites, organic pollution, inorganic pollution, toxins, virtually every issue associated with salmon farming is a, a simple byproduct of trying to produce what is inherently an expensive species to produce, ecologically expensive, and trying to do it cheaply. The salmon aquaculture industry in British Columbia has come a long way in reducing their impact on the environment. But if they want to be considered an even somewhat sustainable industry, they're going to have to overcome two major challenges. To start, the industry is going to have to continue to reduce the amount of wild fish in the salmon feed because the oceans are running out of fish. And if aquaculture is going to be part of this solution, it doesn't make sense to raise farm salmon on a diet that requires more wild fish to produce less salmon meat. And second, the industry must continue to invest in a complete shift to land-based, closed containment systems. It will be an expensive process, but it is definitely worth the cost. We saw how these fish fuel entire ecosystems and how they fed people for thousands of years and how wild salmon provide far more economic benefits than salmon aquaculture will ever provide. So let's do everything possible to protect this resource for generations to come.
controversy that surrounded salmon farms when my inquiry began continues. In my respectful view, when DFO has simultaneous mandates to conserve wild stocks and promote the salmon farming industry, there are circumstances in which it may find itself in a conflict of interest because of divided loyalties. I accept the evidence that a devastating disease could sweep through a wild population, killing large numbers of wild fish without scientists being aware of it. In my view, salmon farms should not be permitted to operate unless it is clear that they pose no more than a minimal risk to Fraser River sockeye salmon. 